Hey, this is Bob Kendrick, Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City, Missouri, and you're listening to the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John and Pete. All right, let's get it. Man, it is so cool to be here. I really appreciate it. You come in on a, a day off, and it's raining here in Missouri, uh, in Kansas City, and we're sitting here on the bench staring at Satchel Paige and Buck Leonard and all these uh, bronze statues, Leon Day, and... Uh, it's cool. This, I love how this is set up. It's sort of like a, a frozen moment in the field of dreams yeah. for uh, Negro Leaguers. And I, I, I used to, so I used to live here for a while when I was doing training at, out at Fort Leavenworth. And okay. I would come by because I'm, I'm big on baseball. And uh, I always wanted to try to capture the story of the place. So if you'd indulge me, that's sort of what I'd like to do and, and get from you. You know, what are the... Uh, what are the interesting things that people who are going to come to Kansas City, what should they know about this place? What just still to this day baffles you? you know, all these things that are, well, this is a magical place. Tell me about it. Well, it, it, it is really a special place. And we're so proud of the work that we've done in Kansas City to keep the legacy of the Negro Leagues alive, a history whose origins began in Kansas City in 1920. As a matter of fact, people just right around the corner from where we operate, the old Paseo YMCA. That is the birthplace of the Negro Leagues. That is where Rube Foster and a contingent of eight independent black baseball team owners met in Kansas City in 1920 to form what will become the Negro National League, the first uh, organized professional base, black baseball league. The leagues would then go on to operate for 40 years from 1920 until 1960. Mm. And, and of course that surprises people because most of them come with at least a baseline understanding that Jackie Robinson breaks the color barrier in 1947. So I think the general assumption is if Robinson broke the color barrier in 1947, if there was a Negro League, surely it would have ended in and around that time. It operated for another 13 years mm. because it took Major League Baseball 12 years before every Major League team had at least one black baseball player, right. the Boston Red Sox being the last team to integrate in 1959 Pumps. when they signed Pumpsy Green. Absolutely. Right. So that is what afforded the Negro Leagues an opportunity to continue to do business. Well, fast forward, the question sometimes is asked, well, why Kansas City? Well, that is why. Mm -hmm. That is why, sure. because Kansas City is the birthplace of the Negro Leagues. We sat forward with building a museum to pay tribute to not only one of the great chapters in baseball history, but one of the great chapters in American history. And so we came into existence in 1990. So we're 25 years old now. And it's been an amazing 25 years of documenting, celebrating, substantiating the richness of a piece of history that for so long toiled in anonymity in terms of its recognition of its historical merits by American historians. Sure. And then we came along to tell the story, to bring the story to life uh, for now thousands and thousands of people who come here to visit. And so when you walk into this place, you've essentially walked into an old ballpark. Yeah. Yeah, so the look, the feel, the sound, sure. all very reminiscent of being in an old ballpark the only difference is in this old ballpark, you're going to meet some new baseball heroes, folks yeah. that you should have known about. You should have known. Yeah. yeah. yeah you you should have known if they were born today. Yeah. And so you should have known about them years ago. Many are just discovering some of the guys that you mentioned mm -hmm. in your opening. Right. Yeah. And, and so it's, 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 a, it's an amazing experience. And, and we're seated on what is called the field of legends. Oh, okay. Yes. The Field of Legends, as you can see to, and to describe to your listeners, is a mock baseball diamond that houses 10 of 12 life-size bronze sculptures of Negro League greats. Now, the significance of the 10, as you can see, they're cast in position as if they were playing a game. They represent 10 of the first group of Negro League players to be inducted into the National Baseball Hall of Fame ah, at Cooperstown. Okay. So that's how our all-star team was chosen. Sure. On the outside looking in is my dear friend, the late, great John Buck O'Neill, yeah. who is the only one of our collection of statues that's not in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. We all believe that it is a travesty that Buck O'Neill is not in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. But in this capacity, old Buck is managing this great all-star team that we're assembling. Sure, yeah. So what we hoped would happen was our visitors would come in through the turnstiles, peer through that old chicken wire backstop, yeah. see this incredible display, and we hope it invokes that desire that I can't wait to get out there on the field. Sure, yeah. But, uh -huh, but at the Negro Leagues Museum, uh -huh. we segregate you from the field. 
Mm. Yeah, we wanted our visitors to at least remotely experience what segregation was like. Mm. So in the case of these great athletes, knowing full well they were good enough to play in the major leagues. Sure, yeah. So close to it. Yeah. Yet so far from it. Yeah. So from most vantage points in the museum, you can always see the field, but you can't get to it. Yeah, that's heavy, man. That's heavy. And I, I see Buck O'Neill cut out over there kind of looking off into the distance. <laughs> and uh, you say his name, and, and uh, it evokes an emotional response and a physical response to me because he's, he's so important. And actually, so, so just the other day, it was Jackie Robinson Day yeah. in, uh, in Major League Baseball. And uh, I always read something about Jackie because it, it's, it's – one of the most proud moments we can be as Americans when he took on that role. And I was reading a, a, an article by uh, Joe Posnanski. I've read it in the past, but just years before, Jackie Robinson was playing baseball at UCLA, and he batted 097. Yeah. And then just fast forward a couple years later, and he's, he's not only Rookie of the Year, the next year he's MVP. And so here's a guy that, that was an incredible athlete and did something that's – Apart from his Hall of Fame credentials as an athlete, as a baseball player, really what he did was so much more important. He, he made, you know, he, he ended the segregation thing. He made it all right. You know, yeah. Because Pumpsy Green wasn't going to do that. No. 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 And, and, and that's the thing. I mean, that's why you had to have the right guy. Yeah. And, and as you just touched on, baseball was Jackie's weakest sport. Yes. Yeah, he was a much better basketball, football, and track guy. Right. He turned himself yeah. into a Hall of Fame baseball player, which, again, exemplifies the caliber of athlete right. that he was. He was a tremendous athlete. Sure. So the question is always raised, was he the best player in the Negro Leagues? Of course not. No. There were other guys who were far better baseball players at that time sure. than Jackie Robinson, but – you had to have the right guy. Right. And, and Jackie turned himself into a great baseball player, but he had the intangibles that certainly better prepared him to deal with the racial hatred that he would be asked to deal with mm -hmm. when he took the field as a member of the Brooklyn Dodgers. And if you had the wrong guy, then there were a lot of those guys mm -hmm. who had been so acclimated to segregation that they could not have handled that social environment and the experiment would have ended miserably. Yeah. So you, you Branch Ricky had a double difficult task of mm. identifying the right guy right. because failure was not an option on either side of the equation. Yeah. If Robinson can't take the abuse, the experiment is over. Right. If Robinson can't play, the experiment yeah, is over. over. Right. How does Branch Ricky know? You know, I think the scouts had – a good report on Robinson. Okay. He played well his one year right. with the Monarchs. Yeah. yeah. He did. He played well. But, you know, the, so the scouts had come back and said, yeah, he can play. Right. And I think once those two men laid eyes on each other, and, and as I know the story, this monumental decision happened in a span of three hours. Wow. Upon meeting each other at Ricky's office, and two very strong will men came to one accord and it literally changed the course of American history. American history. So yes. you needed someone who was strong enough not to fight back, but you also needed someone who was strong enough to speak out once the yeah. opportunity presented itself. It's, uh, and, you know, unfair for me to color with this broad of a brush, but I'm going to do my best to capture this. Not only is there the, the ingrained, indoctrinated, inculcated racial distaste from a white to black perspective, but there's also the folks that are maybe in the middle that can be moved by an intelligent, well-spoken, powerful person like Jackie. And, and to understand that aspect that some people are just going to, it's going to, they're never going to get there. It's going to take 20, yeah. 30 years for some folks to say, oh, this is all right. But if we can get some of the people to move from the middle, you have to have the right person for that too. They have to be able to of course, speak intelligently and clearly and, and not be of you course. Know, they have to be a good face for that. And well, it's, it's tough. You know, and, to and it, it is. And because I think that was just as important. Obviously, you had to have a guy who was talented enough to play great baseball. Right. You know, but they were playing great baseball in the Negro Leagues the entire time. Sure. You know, I think you talked about it in your opening. One of the most difficult things for people to understand when they come here is that there were two professional baseball leagues operating simultaneously to one another. Right, yes. One gave the best white players an opportunity to showcase his world-class skills. Right. The other did the same exact thing for the best black and Hispanic baseball players to showcase their world-class yes. baseball skills. 
Both leagues were professional. Unfortunately, if it didn't happen in the major leagues, well, in the minds of many, right. it didn't happen. It didn't count, yeah. and, and the thing about it was there were probably a, a number of guys who could have succeeded mm -hmm. at this. But, again, Jackie was the right choice. Right. Because you could have gone and gotten – Monty Irvin had been approached before Jackie. Sure. Monty Irvin had that same pedigree. Yeah. Monty Irvin was a better baseball player than Jackie was at that time. Monty Irvin was a superstar right. in the Negro League. Okay. But Monty, too, was college educated, had served in the military, was married, yeah. stable. So he had those same intangibles that Jackie had, but Monty had just gotten back from World War II. Uh -huh. So Monty was, I think, going through what we now would coin post-traumatic syndrome. Yeah, sure. So not? he felt like he needed to get his baseball legs underneath him and, and was having some contract squabbles with Effa Manley, who owned the Newark Eagles. Sure. And so he declined the opportunity. Mm. And that's when Ricky went to, to Jackie Robinson. So... So, same intangibles. Monty Irving gets approached first. And he ultimately goes to the Giants. Go, ultimately goes to the Giants. And, and at the same time, same year, Larry Doby mm -hmm. is going on. Can you kind of expand on what Larry Doby went through? Well, Larry Doby went through the same thing. He's the forgotten man. Yes. But, you know, that's how we are in our society. We never remember the second guy. Right. So, yes. Jackie breaks color barrier in the National League with the Brooklyn Dodgers. Larry Doby, just several weeks later, would break the color barrier in the American League, and he's almost an afterthought. Right. But Doby went through certainly just as much, some will argue even more, because he's in the American League. Yeah. And the American League wasn't nearly as liberal mm. as the National League. You go back and look, it took the American League far longer to yeah. integrate than it did the National League. The National League was far more aggressive at bringing black baseball players. And the National League cities were primarily urban cities. Mm, okay. Yeah. Cleveland was almost like being south at that sure, time. Sure, yeah. And, and so Doby, Jackie was 26, 27, 28 20, years yeah, old. Yeah, right. Larry Doby was 23. He was a baby. Ah. Larry Doby was a baby thrown into a powder keg of racism. Larry Doby never played a day in the minor leagues. He went straight from the Newark Eagles over to the Whoa. Cleveland Indians. Yeah. And, and so, yeah, he withstood the same thing. And while the world was watching Jackie, yeah. nobody's paying Larry any attention whatsoever. Was, and so how did Larry compare as, as a player to, uh, to Jackie? Larry Doby was a star player, too, and then it, again with the Newark Eagles. Right. You can tell that Newark Eagles team was pretty doggone good. You had yeah. Monty Irvin and Larry yeah. Doby right. both playing on the team, and both guys were really primarily infielders who got moved to the outfield when they got to the major leagues. And so, no, Larry Doby was an outstanding athlete as well, outstanding baseball player. You know, it took so long for him to finally get into the National Baseball Hall of Fame. And so he is so underrated from that standpoint – as much as a Hall of Famer can be underrated. Right, yeah. You know, it just took a long time before people recognized his achievements and his accomplishments. Uh, but he finally got in the Hall of Fame, in the, I think, sometime in the 2000s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a lot later. And, and literally, he and Jackie did the same thing at the exact same, same time. time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, but, we, the, but there were three other guys who go up in 1947 who com are completely an afterthought. Absolutely. Let's talk about those guys. Hank Thompson, uh -huh. Willett Brown, right. and Dan Bankhead. I defy anybody to know those three names. <laughs> who doesn't work here? And that's an incredible thing. So, I mean, Branch Rickey gets the credit. Jackie gets the credit. But this movement was, was going to happen. I think eventually. Right. You know, you have to believe that the game was going to integrate at some point in time. The question is, where would they go to bring this talent in? Right. That's why the Negro Leagues were so important, mm. because the Negro Leagues basically gave them great talent. Right. You know, I guess you could have eventually gone, as the Negro Leagues did in many occasions, gone to the historically black colleges and universities sure. and, and tried to develop players from, from those HBCUs, mm -hmm. which is one of the reasons, one of the little-known facts about the Negro Leagues is that nearly 40% of his athletes were college-educated men. Wow. Yeah. Compare that to the major leagues at that same time. Sure. Perhaps yeah. less than 5% yeah. of major leaguers had any college education. College wasn't a path to the No, pros. no, right. because major leagues didn't want you to go to college. Right, they yeah. got you out of high school, put you into the farm system, yeah. and you work your way to the big leagues. Yeah. The Negro Leagues didn't have that kind of farm system. Mm. So they trained on historically black colleges and universities, okay. would play the black college baseball teams, and then recruited a great deal of their workforce huh. from those HBCUs. So truthfully... The Negro Leagues had a disproportionate number of college-educated edu athletes wow. in comparison to the major leagues, but the belief, the stereotypical belief was these men weren't smart enough 
to play in the major league. You, yeah, it's just it's, it's baffling. Yeah, it is baffling. Well, Jackie walks into a dugout, yeah. Pete, where he's likely the most intellectual being <laughs> in that dugout. Right. You know, yet he's subjected to this incredibly oh, harsh treatment. Man. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, I'm a veteran, and, and I've worked overseas a lot and everything. And, and the humbling process of coming back and having nobody wanting to talk to you or interview yes. you, I, I can't imagine Jackie's – not to have, I have any near like the struggle that he did, but it hurts. And I know I have friends, the same thing where it hurts us when we come back and here we have a guy in the same situation, just being humble. His, his, his epic journey from, you know, okay, we're going to break this color barrier this year and, and getting rejected every and having to well, just, the, just the will to get to well, the spring training. You think about it. People came expressly to, to boo you, right. To yell, insulting things at you. Matter of yeah. fact, the people who were coming in all likelihood weren't even baseball fans. Right. No, these were haters, as Buck would say. They yeah. just came. They may not have ever been to a baseball game before, but they came expressly to boo Jackie and right. to boo Larry and those other black stars as yeah. they transitioned into the major leagues. And so to be able, and, and as you well know, this is a game that is tough enough to play Boy. under any circumstances. Yeah. When you put the weight of an entire race of people on one man's back and he has to go out and step across those lines and perform and perform at a level that not only equals but actually exceed mm. his teammates in order to be there, that's an incredible weight to bear. Yeah. And somehow he did it, and he did it with class, grace, and dignity. Yeah. You know, in a game of failure, mm. baseball by its nature – is a game of failure. Yeah. And he can't fail. Right. He can't fail. He can't do it. No. If he fails, it sets this experiment back, who knows, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, years, years or yeah. more before another black man would have gotten that opportunity. So that's a lot about the Jackie Robinson stuff. But I want to do credit to the other great players that Absolutely. are here. From this, from their era, white or black, great nicknames. I mean, here you have uh, uh, Turkey Stearns, Mule Suttles, just these great names. What are some of your favorite names from the Negro Leagues? Well, you got to start, I think, at the top of the list, Cool Papa Bell. Oh, man, yeah. By, to me, by, by large, the greatest nickname in baseball history. Yes. And it fit him to a T. I love it when you call me Cool Pop. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, this, I don't want to tell the stories because this is your job, but tell us the stories about a guy named Cool Papa Bell. Well, Cool Papa Bell is still believed to be the fastest man to ever play this game. Yeah. Clocked him in an amazing 12 seconds circling the bases from home to home. As you well know, his good friend Satchel Page said yeah. of Cool that he was so fast he could walk in the room, turn off the lights, get in bed, pull up the covers before the room went dark. That's but fast. I, I, yeah, that's fast. Yeah. I can tell you this. You don't have to fictionalize the speed of Cool Papa Bell. Cool Papa Bell once stole – 175 bases in a less than 200 game season. Say what? Yeah. Twice scored from first base on a bunt in exhibition games against Major League All Stars. Old Buck would tell the story. The great Buck O'Neill would tell a story that they were playing in Mexico, and Cool goes from first to third so fast on a single that the Mexican team stopped the game in protest because they swore he had cut across the diamond, that no man could get around the bases that fast. And obviously he used that legendary speed to track down everything in everything. the outfield, yeah. just ran it down because yeah. he didn't have a strong arm. He hurt his arm. He came to the Negro Leagues as a pitcher. Ah. Uh, he, and that's where the story has it that he earned his nickname Cool because he struck out the great Oscar Charleston in a bases loaded situation. Nice. And, and one of the guys said, that's one cool papa. He was cool papa until he passed away in St. Louis. Um, and, and certainly one of the great Hall of Fame stars from the Negro Leagues. But, uh, you know what, a lot of people don't know that Satchel's real name is Leroy. Yeah, that's yeah, right. You know, huh? yeah. Because when, when your nickname, and Satchel is his nickname, yeah. but it personified him. It did. That's how everybody knows him. The yeah. same with Buck O'Neill. Yeah. His real name is John. Right. But everybody knew him as Buck. And, and so these great nicknames, and, and, and of course, as he said, I think in the Negro Leagues in particular, if you didn't have a great nickname, that means you weren't very good. Yeah. Uh, you know, so they all had these great colorful nicknames. And, you know, where we're sitting here on the field, and the satchel, of course, is on the mound. But you have the great Martin De Higo at the plate, El Maestro. El Maestro. El Maestro, the master. Yes. Because he could do it all. 
Ah, okay. Played all nine positions. Right. Played all nine of them well. The only baseball player in the history of our sport to be in five different countries. Baseball Halls of Fame. Say, say what? Five different countries, Baseball Halls of Fame. Mexican, Cuban, Venezuelan, Dominican, and in Cooperstown. So, yeah, and, and it's good to point out that, um, yes, the African-American segregation existed, but Martin wasn't from the from U.S. From Cuba. Right. Yeah, he was from Cuba. And, and that was, to me, that's why this story is so compelling. Because, quite frankly, Pete, the Negro Leagues didn't care what color you were. Right. Could you All play? they care was can you play. Yeah. And, and, and if you can play, yeah. you can play. Yeah. So this league was filled with different hues, different colors of the rainbow. Sure. And there were even white players who played in the Negro Leagues. I was going to ask that, yeah. But, of course, if you were white and you were good enough, you played in the Major League. Right, now, right. later on, Double Duty, Ratcliffe, and some other guys sure. you know, brought in some white players trying to fill the void. But, again, it just, you know, when you look at it from a global perspective, the Negro Leagues were traveling to Spanish-speaking countries well before major leaguers mm-hmm. were. They, of course, were welcome in those countries. They were playing great baseball right. in those countries, and they were adored. Yeah. So, you know, they were staying in the finest hotels, yeah. eating in the finest restaurants that those countries had to offer, came back home, and Man. was subjected to Jim Crow. Yeah. Yeah, treated, you know, as un-American as anyone could possibly be treated. It's, it, it is incredible. You're right. The difference between going to, say, Cuba to play baseball and being welcomed as real major leaguers and then going to some city and having to pull food out of the back and yeah. go and, be on the bus. And hope you could get a meal. Yeah, yeah. hope, yeah. You, hope could, yeah. you could get a meal. Yeah. And, and, and many times they would sleep on the bus and eat their peanut butter and crackers. Right. Even after filling up the ballpark right. from the same fans who had just cheered them, they couldn't get a meal from them. Right, yeah, because there were white fans there in the stands. There were white fans that were cheering them. And so cool Papa Bell's out there blistering around the bases, you know, getting uh, uh, <laughs> getting hit, was it, get hit by his own line drive at second base. <laughs> he's so, but he's eating peanut butter and crackers, you know. Uh, um, and back then, if the white players had a tough time with guys like Comiskey and everything else and, and how the owners treated them, it, it couldn't have been any better in the Negro Leagues, was it at all? Or? Well, you know, they had their issues with – you know, you had good owner, or you had good owners. Sure, you had owners that weren't so good. You know, right. same thing, just like in Major League Baseball. Yeah, you yeah. got good owners, some that are questionable. Yeah, but you know, so you had a little bit of both. And you know, the the the, the conditions and the, the Negro leagues weren't as well financed mm, okay. as Major League Baseball. Right. Although the talent was just as good. Yeah. Some will say maybe even better because you had both the black and Hispanic, great black and Hispanic players. Right playing here yeah so that that level of play was stellar if you were developing a, as a player of color but you weren't quite major league when i say major league i mean elite negro league play. Yeah. were there were there minor leagues below well in, in many ways the industrial league served mm. as those minor leagues for the negro league okay. so guys got plucked from the industrial leagues mm. and then those historically black colleges and universities those were kind of those training grounds okay for, for Negro League players, and so that's where they identified the bulk of their workforce. So were guys like Mickey Mantle playing on integrated industrial teams as they were coming up? I mean, Ty Cobb kind of went that route where they played on these, these yeah. company teams. Yeah, because most, most, most industry at that time had baseball teams. Right. And most of them had both, either black, they, they had black and white baseball teams. The railways right. had black and white baseball ah, okay. teams. Most businesses had baseball. I mean, again, baseball was so popular. Right. It was our sport. Yeah. So even though football had integrated before, mm-hmm. baseball did, nobody cared. Nobody cared. Nobody went to football games. Nobody yeah. cared. Well, and the quality of a football game back then is nothing compared to what it was now. Yeah. But Martin DeHigo could play baseball today. Absolutely. Right. These guys transcend time. Yeah. 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 As a matter of fact, you sometimes it just makes you wonder, could you pay these guys now? You know, with the money Man. that's being made now. Yeah. How much money would Satchel Paige get today? All of it. How much money would Josh Gibson get, you know, with today's market? You know, Gibson, lifetime batting average of three fifty four mm-hmm. to go with that tremendous power. Right. Yeah. You know, some, they, they estimate well over 900 home runs right. in his illustrious career against all levels of competition. Great arm. You yeah. know, uh, as you look around this room, you just wonder, I mean, Gosh, yeah, if the market, what, what fair market would bring these guys under today's standards. Yeah. If you like the show, and you know you do, support the show. There are three ways you can support us. 
Number one, go to iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you listen to podcasts. And leave a five-star rating and review. It helps with the show metrics and helps us get better placement. Number two, visit our website, www.breakitdownshow.com. We've got an Amazon and an eBay link. Same Amazon, same eBay, you know and love, but they give us a little kickback when you get to their site from ours. And number three, leave comments about the shows that you like. We want to know what you think, how you feel. Tell us how to make the show better. We greatly appreciate it. Now back to the show. Yeah, you 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 want to be able to pull some cool Papa Bell out and say, <laughs> and these guys are making hundreds of millions of dollars just for the baseball part. That doesn't include the shoe that you get, you know? No, no. Uh-uh. And then imagine the shoes that they wore. You oh, know? No. Yeah. I mean, it was it was a dress shoe with cleats attached yeah, to it. Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> they, had, they would look and be like, are you kidding me? Look at the yeah. diet that these guys yeah. have. I mean, the doctors, I mean, well, doctors are very friendly to our show, so we're always friendly to them. But they have a guy named Gabe Kapler that manages their minor leagues, and he's like, we're going to have quinoa, and we're going to have kale. But you guys are going to eat well and healthy. You know, these guys would just be like, are you kidding me? We had white bread. <laughs> yeah, well, they, yeah, you know, and, and it was amazing. And you wonder about that. You mm. know, they weren't privy to the same kind of training. Sure. Uh, they didn't have the kinds of facilities. And, and in the case of the Negro Leagues, long bus rides, yeah. two, three games in a day. You know, the living conditions were horrible. Horrible. You know, unless yeah. they could find black-owned accommodations to, to take care of them. Right. And yet, somehow or another, they were still able to perform and perform at a high level. Sure, yeah. And, and so that's why I say you have great baseball players today, but these were great athletes. Right. They were great athletes who happened to be baseball players. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no some of these guys that. might have played they something played, else. Oh, yeah. they could have played anything. Right. Most of these guys were multi-sport stars mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and could have played professionally and several of them did yeah. play, you know, professionally in basketball and 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 baseball. Uh, Jackie Robinson might have been the best basketball player in the country. Right. You yeah. know, he turned down a ten thousand dollar contract from the Harlem Globetrotters. Right. You know, instead to sign with the Brooklyn Dodgers. If I'm not mistaken, his brother broke the world record in the two hundred as Je- as Jesse Owens broke it also, but faster. You know, I mean, yeah. you're talking yeah. elite elite level talent. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it's a it's an incredible thing to think about what they're what what they would say now. Now, who, who is left out there that's still a prominent, uh, like Hank Aaron, uh, Willie Mays are both still with us. They yeah. both have Negro League. Uh, both in the Hall of Fame. They're the only two guys mm-hmm. from the Negro Leagues that are in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Okay. Sadly, we're lo- we lost Monty Irvin this sure. year. Yeah. So, and Ernie Banks last year. Oh, that's year. right. Yeah, Ernie Banks. You know, that's right, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and Manny Minoso last year. Yeah. So those marquee names from the Negro Leagues are passing on. Yeah just as the players from the Negro Leagues in general are passing on. And so, you know, we knew from the onset that it was going to be literally a race against time. Right. That the people who made this history were all going to be gone at some point in time to take it a step further. The people who saw them play yeah. were all going to be gone at some point in time. And so it puts a little added pressure on us as an institution to gather as much of this information while we have them um, because every time we lose one, we lose a piece of that history. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so in the not-so-distant future, there won't be any Negro League players left. Yeah, there won't be any left. And there won't be, uh, are there any of the owners left? Are those guys all passed now? They're pretty much all gone. Yeah, they were older. Yeah, it's a, uh, you're right. It's, it's a dying piece of, of history that, you know, Buck O'Neill knew so much and had yeah. such great recall. Oh, absolutely. You know, and we didn't think Buck was ever going to die. If anybody was going <laughs> right. to defy death, yeah. it was going to be Buck. Right. He was so young and exuberant and charismatic into his 90s. And then the realization, even though we know no one's going to live forever, right. but if anybody was, it was going to be old Buck yeah. or Monty Irvin because they had that same kind of personality. Mm. And, you know, they were the kind of people that you always felt better leaving them yeah. than you did when you came to see them. Yeah. Who do you think, um, I'll say, I think it might be Josh Gibson, but who, who was the closest to the majors, had the most miles left um, in their game, but just never quite got through and broke through and ended up playing all well, time. Gibson, obviously, Gibson was 35 when Robinson broke the color barrier. Mm-hmm. So, really, he's too old by baseball standards. Right. Even though Gibson was still performing well, he was sick. Right. Yeah, Gibson, of course, dies from a brain tumor sure. just a few months before Jackie breaks right. the color barrier. Obviously, he was aware that the Dodgers had signed 
Jackie Robinson. So, you know, he was, by baseball standards, too old. Mm. Buck Leonard was too old. Right. You know, the great Ray Dandridge would mm-hmm. make it up into the old Minneapolis Millers. Right. Uh, who were the New York Giants Triple A team? Right. Well, Ray Dandridge would name MVP of the Millers when he was 38 years old. Right. You know, but there was no way the Giants were going to bring up a 38 year old black third baseman sure. yeah. because he wasn't going to give him enough service time. Right. So he didn't get that opportunity. Mm. The superstars in the Negro leagues were too old. Yeah. Yeah. You really and, so that's and why you a get lot of money too compared to what well, they would have made in the majors. I'm assuming well, you know a guy like Satchel who might, who may have been the highest paid player in the country right. at that time. Yeah, because everybody wanted to see Satchel pitch. Pitch. He took a pay cut to go to the major league. Right. Yeah, because along the barnstorming circuits, he's filling up the ballpark. Sure. Everybody wanted to see the old man pitch. Yeah. Because the lore and legend, I don't know if there's any more lore and legend that surrounds any one athlete. Than Satchel Page. He is you know, because you didn't know how old he was, right? And, and of course, he played that age thing up to a, to the hilt. Sure, but in all likelihood, he was some maybe ten years older than what he claimed to be. Yeah, but he was still dealing. Yeah, yeah. And so along the barnstorming circuit, people were just flocking to see Satchel pitch. Right, he was getting a percentage of the game. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. he was a savvy businessman yeah. as well. Yeah. But he wanted to prove to the world that he could pitch on any stage. Yeah, well, you know, and he and he did, and he pitched. You know, he had to go kind of with the stunt kind of thing towards the end because he was. Yeah, well, he didn't have his stuff anymore. Right, he didn't have his stuff, but, but he had also, guile exactly, and that's how he made his guile. living. You know, because yeah, he was t- super talented, right. but he also was like he was a showman. Well, yeah, and see he, that side we didn't get to see of Satchel when he got to the major league. Uh-huh, right, he couldn't bring that side. Right, you know, because that's what the major leaguers were all for. You know kind of frowning on that these guys were too mm-hmm. charismatic they right. show boaters that kind of thing so that that colorful nature of satchel he had to leave in the negro leagues yeah. now again you can't be yourself yeah right. satchel was a showman right you know but you can't do that now once you go to the major leagues everybody frowning at that but he was still able to lock in now he goes six and one yeah in his rookie year yeah. in the major leagues yeah. at either 42 yeah. or 52 depending on who, depending exactly. on who you ask so, yeah. you know, he didn't have that blazing fastball like he did in his prime. Sure, yeah. But what he never lost was the control. Yeah. The pinpoint control. Yep. The man Changing. could, oh, he could put it where he wanted to put it. Yeah. And he could still change up speeds mm-hmm. on it. And as he got, you know, older, he dropped down three quarters. He'd sure. give you a little bit different arm angles and that kind of thing. But the control never left him. Never left. He could mm-hmm. always do that. Yeah, he's uh, he is the iconic. When you think of barnstorming, you think of black players, and you think of Satchel, think of Satchel Page. Page. Yeah, no, Satchel Page is the name. Satchel Page is the the to me the bear the bear standard mm. uh, as it relates to the to the Negro leagues. Although there were so many great players, right. there was right. only one Satchel Page. Though. One one Satchel Page. Who's Satchel Page's uh, major league peer from from that era? Do you think? I don't know. <laughs> You know, there are a lot of great pitchers, sure. a lot of great pitchers in this game. But to me, even when I hear the guys in the Negro Leagues talk about Satchel this way, with such great reverence, even if it's in a comparative standpoint, you hear people say, well, such and such was just as good as Satchel. Right. Or his fastball was as fast yeah. as Satchel. Right. But when you become the standard yeah. for which everybody else compares, right. you got to be pretty good. You got to And be I good. think that was the thing with Satchel. So when you look at a guy who had – the stuff, the stuff, yeah, and the charisma and the moxie to go along with it. I'm not sure there's anybody comparable to Satchel Paige. Yeah, and that doesn't take anything away from no. all those great major sure. league pitchers. They were great guys who had dominant stuff. They didn't have that showmanship that right. Satchel had. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. Where uh, and, and to me, when you look at that, the complete package, right? I think anybody's close to Satchel. When I when I think about what the Negro leagues were to baseball and where we are now. You know, back then, even even white players had to do other things besides play baseball. And and that's not the case anymore. If you're good, it'll get recognized. Mm -hmm. You can be good in Taiwan and come over here. So so that's one of the things that that these players, these ghosts, have given the the players. Now, someone like uh, Araldis Chapman can come out. And and make millions of dollars pitching one inning, one inning essentially. And and uh, uh, if you blow out your an- elbow, you know you can come out. And these guys didn't have that. You oh, know, no. Satchel probably blew his elbow out. Well, you know, amazingly for a guy who threw as much as he did, uh-huh. you know, he's pitching two or three innings almost every single day. Yeah. And for a guy who threw as much as he did, as hard as he did, had one bout of arm problems uh-huh. back in the I guess in the late thirties, and they worked it out. 
Mm. They worked it out. The trainer at that time, the Monarchs had a trainer named Frank Floyd. Mm -hmm. And um, Floyd would massage his shoulder and put the hot water on yeah. and probably horse liniment or whatever else <laughs> yeah, right. they had until his arm came back to mm -hmm. life. And he never had another bout of arm problem mm -hmm. the rest of his illustrious career. It is amazing, yeah. given the, the, the wear and tear on that old man's body sure. uh, from pitching that as much as he did. Is absolutely three phenomenal. games in a day, Sometimes. any number of times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It is. It is incredible. What uh, What else do we need to know about the, the the Negro Leagues that maybe isn't commonly known? Oh, the innovations. Okay. The innovations that came out of the Negro Leagues. You know, night baseball. They were playing night games in the. Uh, they were playing night games in the Negro Leagues five years before they ever played a night game in the major leagues. Now, our history book tells us that the first professional night baseball game. 1935, Crossley sure. Field, Crossley Cincinnati, Field. Ohio, Cincinnati mm -hmm. Reds versus Philadelphia Phillies. Yeah. Well, the history book is wrong. <laughs> the first professional night baseball game took place in 1930, and it featured our very own Kansas City Monarchs. J.O. Wilkinson literally mortgaged everything he had to pioneer night baseball. Huh. Portable, generated light towers. Wow. So not only could they play a night game here. They could play it anywhere. They could load them up on the truck and play one anywhere. Huh. And, and, and quite frankly, Wilkie wasn't doing it to be innovative. He was doing it for survival. They oh, only yeah. had Sunday games primarily to get fans into the ballpark. Back right. then, Major League Baseball didn't play on Sundays. Sure, yeah. So the Negro Leagues would rent the ballpark, play that Sunday doubleheader. I got we you. left church. Yeah. Going straight to the game, dressed to the nines, as nines, they would say. Yeah, looking yeah. good. Uh -huh. And so Wilkie was looking for a way to get the working class fan into the ballpark. Sure. Night baseball became the answer. Night baseball became bigger than Sunday games. Sure. Now, mind you, uh -huh. Sunday games were so popular that black churches uh -huh. would move their service time oh, up an hour. <laughs> now, if you know anything about the black church, I do. You don't mess with service time. I, I, will, I will tell you, my dad's got a degree in divinity and part of the, the climb. But, so for those of you who don't know, I'm a white guy. So my dad has a degree in divinity. And part of that was we had to go around and go to churches. We also, my dad was the guy that helped my our church uh, buy the pipe organ. So I've been to a lot of church. And there's a whole lot of Jesus in a black Baptist. You better bring a sack lunch. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Hands up, praising all day long. <laughs> and, yeah, so yeah. to get so to get anybody out of there, you must be a good draw, you know, because and, good and, Lord. And, and the monarchs were so yeah. was typical Sunday service. We started at eleven o'clock, was moved up to yeah. ten o'clock, and we filed out of church, going straight to the ballpark, yeah. dressed to the nines for that Sunday sure. doubleheader. Yeah. Night baseball was even bigger than that. But, you know, again, here's where the fallacy occurs. Okay. American historians never view Negro Leagues baseball as being professional. Mm. Thus, the major leagues could get credited with something that had happened yeah. five years before. But, you know, yeah. other advent, shin guards, mm -hmm. the batting helmet, mm. all these things originate from the Negro Leagues. Wow. But, you know, the style of play. Mm -hmm. The style of play was different. Yeah. It was fast. It was aggressive. It right. was daring. They bunted their way on. They stole second. They steal third. And if you weren't too smart, they steal home. Yeah. It was a much more exciting brand of baseball. Major League Baseball was kind of a base-to-base -base game. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. guy got on base. Sure. You moved him over to second. And then the big hitters tried to drive him in. Yeah. But not Negro Leagues. It yeah. was quick. It was what our Kansas City Royals Mm -hmm. have done yeah. over these last couple of years yes. that people had not not seen. Right. You know, it was predicated on great pitching, great defense, you know, spectacular plays, timely hitting. They call it small ball. Yeah. Jack guys in Negro League hit the ball out the ballpark. Josh but Gibson, these guys oh, could do everything. They yeah. all could run. They were great athletes. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you, like you were saying, if the quality of the, of the players – was elite because there were no real NFL stars because those guys mm. all played baseball. No, man, if you're going to make a living playing professionally, yeah. you played baseball. You played baseball. You didn't play basketball. You didn't do. You, you couldn't make uh, um, $100,000 plus a year running track. No. You went out. So the best possible athletes were, were playing baseball on these fields. Yeah. Yes, sir. Playing, playing, and, uh, playing at a high level. Good Lord. You think about that, like all the, the hundreds and hundreds of players – the cream really was in, in baseball, in the Negro Leagues, in the major and, leagues. Yeah, both sides. You had great athletes performing at the maximum level. Yeah. But they were great athletes. Right. 
You know, like I said today, we have great baseball players. Sure, yeah. Some of those guys, their their athletic ability wouldn't translate to another sport, though. Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, the, the, like Don Mattingly is one of those kind of guys where he was made to be a baseball player. It, he wasn't going to play linebacker. Yeah. It's just not what he was built for. But you're right. Someone like Dave Winfield or someone oh, yeah. like Ricky Henderson – those guys were wonderful athletes that were able to work hard and craft a real career. And, and play, they just tra- they transition that athleticism mm-hmm. into baseball. Right. You know, but they, these guys could have starred in any sport. Any sport. And, and Dave yeah. did. Dave's yeah. a good friend of the museums and a good friend of mine. One of the greatest athletes of mm-hmm. all time who doesn't get his just due. Dave Winfield mm-hmm. played Major League Baseball, yes. was drafted in the NFL, yes. was drafted in by the NBA yes, and, and the ABA, <laughs> you know, and, and so he—he's one of the most amazing athletes yeah. of all time. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Dave Winfield is was was special, and um, you know, he's his career is possible because of these. these oh, no question, guys and, sitting out here, and, and they all understand that. You know, mm-hmm. I've had time to spend with Dave Winfield and the likes of Ozzy Smith, oh, and yeah. guys like that who clearly mm-hmm. and they understand it. And they appreciate it and they respect what these men did. Mm -hmm. These guys were the bridge builders. Mm. Ozzy Smith, Dave Winfield, Henry Aaron, Ernie Banks, those guys, they crossed the bridge. Yeah. Yeah, they crossed the bridge. But that bridge was built by these men. Yeah. Our museum celebrates the bridge builder. Yeah. Yeah, because rarely in our society do we celebrate the guy who built the bridge. We always celebrate the people who crossed over the bridge. Yeah. But here we celebrate the bridge builders. Yeah. Yeah, no, and it's good that you do. Uh, we had Drez from Black Sheep on our show, and he talked in the, in the same way about rap and, and the, mm-hmm. the people that kind of broke off and started doing this. And he's like, I'm one of the guys where I laid down and I built part of the bridge, and, and the guys that are out there performing today, they they don't all pay the bill like we all did. Mm-hmm. And he, he talks in terms of um, uh, an image that he's had, like in terms of a dream where – He's running and running. He's in the uh, uh, the Underground Railroad, and in his dream, and he's running and running and running and running, and uh, uh, obviously being chased, you know. And then he gets he gets there, and it's curtains. He opens the curtains, and there's a microphone. And he's like, and now what am I gonna say? Am I gonna talk about women and drinking? No, I have something more important to say. Yeah, it's a heavy message. Yeah. What are the uh, do you feel like the baseball players today have enough of? I mean, because you're talking about Ozzie Smith, Dave Winfield. That's a different generation. What about the uh, the modern the modern African American player? Well, I, I think it's difficult to know what no one taught you. Sure. You know, and unfortunately, all of us went through our formal educations without knowing one of the most important chapters, not only in baseball history but in American history. Yeah. That's the story of the Negro Leagues. It's not there, so you you didn't have a chance to learn sure. this in school. So unless you have parents. Mm who sat you down and told you about these guys, you had no way to know. Right. And so I can't condemn the, the young athlete for not knowing this history. Right. But what I do tell the young athlete is that, and is this, no sport holds to its history mm-hmm. the way baseball does. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It is that one sport where we consistently compare the greats of the past sure. with the stars of today. Yeah. And, and so – if you're going to play baseball, you should know the history of this game. Mm-hmm. And the Negro Leagues are a very important part of that history. My job, obviously, is to create that platform in which they get an opportunity to learn about that history. So as teams are coming in to, to play our Kansas City Royals, we work very hard to try and get them over to the museum to mm. get this experience. Most recently, we had the Mets in town to start the season. Yeah. And Curtis Grandison, who's a good friend of the museum, he's been here several times, but he brought David Wright and, nice. and Neil Walker and, and then a, a lot of the Mets uh, administrators and coaching staff came over. And it's always an eye-opening experience for that young athlete sure. when they get here. Yeah. But for the African-American and Hispanic athlete, mm-hmm. This is Mecca. Yeah. These are your roots. Yeah. You know, there mm. is no and ifs, buts about it. You don't play had it not been for these guys. Right. So do is there a deed of gratitude owed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. But they don't know about this history either. Sure. Yeah. No, you're right. It's it's a it's a heavy load if you choose to be aware of it. And then once you are aware of it, how can you do anything but, but, yeah. but admire what these guys did, yeah. what they put up with to, to yeah. give all and, of and, us something better? And, and we hope they support our efforts yeah. to make sure this history stays alive. Yeah. You know, future generations should have an opportunity to come to this museum and, mm-hmm. again, learn something right. that you and I never had an opportunity to learn sure. while we were in school. Yeah. 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 And, and, and then all the intangibles that stem mm-hmm. from this story. 
Yeah. yeah. So this is more than just, I think, a history lesson. Yeah. It's a lesson in humanity. Yeah. It is a lesson in uh, overcoming adversity. Boy. All these things that are, are wrapped inside this wonderful yeah. story of the Negro League. It's, uh, you know, and I'm not trying to have a political conversation, but in our political time when we're so divided and, and, yeah. and we look so poorly upon our nation, the thing I always remind myself is, because I've, I've been around the world in a lot of places, if you look up civil rights or racial equality, other countries don't come up. And this is the place. And I'm, t- I'm talking about the Negro League Museum. This is the kind of place where these guys not only changed baseball. They changed our country. They changed our country because yeah. 20 years later we go through the whole civil yeah. rights uh, movement. And, yeah. and that stuff's more possible because of a guy like Satchel. Because how can you not love Satchel yeah. Paige, you know? Well, and, you know, and I, I truly believe that there was never a time when people did not want to know about the Negro League. Sure. They just had no way had no to way know to about know. the yeah. Negro League. Yeah. But this story embodies the American spirit unlike any story in the annals of American history. It's everything we pride ourselves about being American because it is about pride. Right. It's about passion. It's about perseverance. It is about the refusal to accept the notion that you're unfit to do anything. Mm. So in the case of these great athletes, you won't let me play with you? Then I'll just create a league of my own. <laughs> then that league would grow to rise right. and rival the league that would let them play yeah. in terms of popularity and an in attendance. That is the American way. So even though it was America that was trying to prevent them from sharing in the joys of her so-called national pastime, it was the American spirit yes. that allowed them to persevere yes. and prevail. Yeah, no, it, it's a beautiful thing. So tell us about um, the museum. I, I know that there's been, you know, like any, and I will say young venture because you guys are only, I mean, you're decades old, but but it still, takes a while to create oh, a course. base and be, and be so, yeah, so we're how 20, are you guys, We're yeah. 25 years old, right. but man, we just scratched the surface. Right, exactly. You know, but it's been an amazing journey. We started in a little one-room office there across the street here at Historic 18th and Vine, where uh-huh. you are today. And right. At that time, we had a little office and a conference room table in that little office, and guys like the late great Buck O'Neill and other former Negro leaguers who were living here at that time literally sat around that conference room table, and they took turns paying the monthly rent to wow. keep that little office open. Yeah. So that's how we got started. Yeah. 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 And we've grown from a one-room office to now America's National right. Negro Leagues Baseball yes. Museum yes. over the first you know, quarter century of operations. Yeah. But we're also looking forward to the future, the next 25 right. years yeah. for this great museum. And uh, so you know, from that standpoint, we feel like we just grasped the surface. There's still lots of stories to be told, hopefully things to bring into our collection to help bring those stories to life, mm-hmm. even at a time when we're losing yeah. the people who made the history. Yeah, no, the history, the history part is incredible. And I want to ask you this question. So uh, we do a lot of stuff with filmmakers and actors and that kind of thing. What, what Negro League story is dying to be told? What do we need to see on the big screen? Ooh. And you're talking directly to people that tell stories right now. So. Oh, man, there are so many. I am surprised that young film writers have not come here mm-hmm. because there are so many great stories. Yeah. I am still in belief. You know, I'm number one, I was in disbelief that it took so long to even tell Jackie's story. Right. Yeah, yeah, but again, I think in Hollywood, the belief is that these kinds of films won't sell, right. particularly internationally, because mm, okay. uh, most films are financed with international sure. backing. Yeah. So I think there's this belief that those kinds of stories won't sell. Hopefully the success of 42 mm-hmm. will now allow these stories maybe to come to surface. Yeah. But, you know, stories like the story of Rube Foster. Right, yeah. Who, who formed the Negro Leagues right. here in Kansas City, who may have been the most powerful man in all of sports. So you have to understand that Rube Foster had either booking rights or ownership of four of the original eight Negro League franchises. He divested ownership of three kept the Chicago American Giants, but in a deal with the Negro Leagues, was paid some 15% of the annual gate. Well, in 1920 alone, over 400,000 fans attended Negro League games. There was nobody else had a deal like that. Nobody. And so Rube ran the Negro Leagues, though, like a tyrant. Yeah, yeah, he did. Now, now granted, the Negro Leagues had unparalleled success under Foster, Mm -hmm. but he ran the league like a tyrant. Yeah. And so there were some within the ranks of the Negro Leagues who did not like Rube because they thought he was too powerful. Yeah. Well, the story has it that he's on league business in Indianapolis, mm-hmm. sleeping in his hotel room, exposed to a gas leak. Uh-huh. Passerby comes by, smells the gas, pulls him out. When he comes to, 
he's never the same. Uh, Likely had brain damage. Right. So Rube Foster had to be institutionalized. Mm. Yeah, because he had fits of violent rage. So his family institutionalized him where just a few years later he would die of a mm. heart attack. So one of the most brilliant men in, in baseball history. Right. And some will say the most brilliant man in baseball history dies in an insane asylum. Right. But there's great belief that that gas leak wasn't it wasn't an accident. Yeah. No, that somebody was trying to take old Rube out. Yeah. So you know that that story, the Buck O'Neill story. Oh yeah. You know this this dynamic personality who had worked so hard through all of his life to build yeah. the Negro Leagues Museum, tell the story of the Negro Leagues, get all these other Negro League players into the Hall of Fame. Everybody loves Buck. Yet when it's his turn to get in, he's denied entrance. Yeah. yeah. He misses by one vote. Yeah. You know, but then pushes that aside, goes to Cooperstown, Cooperstown, speaks on behalf of 17 dead folks yeah. who didn't have a voice right. in one of the most epic speeches in, in, in baseball sure. Hall of Fame history. Yes. And then a little over two months later, dies himself uh, at age 94, among shy of his 95th birthday. Yeah. But yeah. as Buck would say, you don't, you know, you don't, you don't have to fictionalize Negro Leagues mm -hmm. to, to make it entertaining. Well, Just tell the story. You know, yeah, and, and uh, maybe this won't make the cut, but I watched the movie The Butler. And I'm like, just tell me the story. Just tell don't, me the story. Don't don't fictionalize mm -hmm. and bring other things. Just tell me because it's yeah. already a rich story. Yeah. And uh, Buck O'Neill, yes, he didn't get into the Hall of Fame. And I I hate that like Santo dies, he gets in. Stabler dies, he gets in. I hate when they do that. Just err on the side of hey, the guy's alive. Let's let him in. Yeah. You know, it, it's close. You know what? Missed by one vote. No, no, no. Don't forget about the secret vote. You're in. You yes. He's, he did too much. You know, Marvin Miller did too much. And these yeah. guys are never going to have that thing. And, yeah. But uh, you can't look at life better than Buck O'Neill did. No, no, no. I, and that's what I admire so much about Buck. And, and I touched upon it earlier. People would ask me, what did, I, what did I remember most about Buck? And it was really quite simple. That the fact that you always felt better leaving Buck than you did when you came to see him. He just had that kind of personality. Yeah. And I was there for the journey, so I was there for the ride. I saw this in places and cities all across this country, right. the way people reacted to this man. Yeah. And so I guess, again, I've said it on, on, on many occasions in Hollywood, they call it the it factor. Yes. And, yes. and Buck had the it factor. Yeah. Yeah, people just responded. But he bridged, he bridged gaps between black and white, mm -hmm. men and women, young and old, yeah. unlike anyone I had ever seen in my life. He... Uh, uh, Maybe didn't have Hall of Fame caliber baseball skills, but he's one of the best storytellers of all time. Well, and that's I his think, Hall of Fame. Model. I think when you look at the body of work. Yes. Yeah. You know, and again, Buck was a great player in the Negro Leagues. Right. Lifetime 288, uh, hit and won a couple batting titles. Great defensive first baseman. Right. Stellar defensive first baseman. But then when you look at the fact that he was a great player, great player, great manager, mm -hmm. uh, goes on to become a scout, signs Hall of Famers, Ernie Banks, right. Lou Brock, hopefully future Hall of Famers and Joe Carter and Lee Smith to their first professional contracts, then breaks barriers himself, becoming the first African-American coach mm -hmm. in Major League Baseball history, became the voice of the Negro Leagues, yeah. responsible for building this museum <laughs> and keeping the legacy of the Negro Leagues alive when it basically had died. Yeah. You, you, you look at that entire body of work, uh. You won't find anyone who has contributed more to this sport than Buck O'Neill. It's true. Maybe and it's about, a bit. it's about baseball contributions. <laughs> yeah. Most yeah. guys are in the Hall of Fame are in the Hall of Fame because they were deemed to be great players, and that's fine. Yeah. But when you look at the body of work and every facet in which Buck O'Neill made an impact, mm -hmm. a great impact on this sport, there's no way that he should not be in the National Baseball Hall of Fame. Mm -hmm. Now, let me preface this by saying I am biased. Yeah, well, you know what, so am I. I I'm, I'm serious. I welled up a little bit as you said that. My eyes are still a little wet because the guy has given us so much. And, you know, God bless his soul. And, and I, I know one and, day he'll get in. And then he used his life. Yes. Yeah, to teach yeah. us that we, that we could indeed get further in this life with love than we could with hate. Yeah, yeah. On top of all of that other stuff. Yeah, yeah. He could have chose to been disappointed and angry. You know, Jackie would be more on the on the surly side. He's like, the Negro Leagues are a minor league. I don't like it here. And, you know, yeah. and Buck was like, it's wonderful here. Yeah. You know? So, again, two guys, right. same situation. They yes. saw it entirely different. Entirely different. <laughs> entirely different. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so tell us uh, uh, how do we find a place. What, oh, also, tell us about the fantastic 18th and Vine um, uh, Museum 
district, as you will, if you would. Just give us all that stuff so people know how to find you guys. Yeah, absolutely. We're located at Historic 18th and Vine, the uh, Historic 18th and Vine Jazz District, just a little bit east of downtown Kansas City, right off of I-70 East, as if you're headed to the to the ballpark. Mm-hmm. And um, 18th and Vine, of course, in its heyday, was as recognized street cross section as there was anywhere in the world yeah. because you had that intrinsic mixture of jazz and baseball. Mm-hmm. Well, fast forward, this the, this complex known as the Museum at 18th and Vine features two museums: yeah. the American Jazz Museum and the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum. So it's unique from that standpoint to have two amazing slices of culture sure. under one roof. And so we're excited about that. Uh, our hours are Tuesday through Saturday, 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., Sundays noon to 6 p.m. We always ask people to call about holiday hours sure. because we're inside of a city building, and so mm-hmm. sometimes the building is closed. Uh, you can find us on the World Wide Web at nlbm.com. Okay. And if you're on Twitter, you can catch up with me at NLBM Prez, P-R-E-Z. <laughs> All right. I, I'm on Twitter. I don't know what I'm doing on Twitter, but I'm on there. <laughs> uh, and try to keep everybody updated yeah. on what's happening with Negro Leagues and Negro Leagues Museum Insight. Well, it has been an absolute treasure and pleasure to be here. I love this place. There's so much emotion in it and everything else. And again, I, I'm feeling... <laughs> I'm kind of embarrassed. I'm feeling so emotional about being here. It's an but emotional it, experience. It, it is, man. It, it, it's, it's, uh, I'm proud of what these guys did yeah. and, and this is the toughness that they showed. And it just it, it hits me. And it's hitting me right now. So if you guys are, are ever in the KC area, you've got to do yourself the favor of coming to the Negro League Museum because it's making me well up right now, you know? <laughs> Thank no. you so much. Peter, it's great to see you, man. Thanks so much. It's great to be on the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah.